Welcome back to 12 Days in March. This special edition of the Year in Review features actual cases from my medical practice. In this case, we'll discuss a patient who presented with an abnormal chest x-ray, and although the questions are hardly perfect, the teaching points are spot on. In this exercise, you have five questions to answer prior to the discussion. And as a reminder, a PDF of this recording is available at the website. And by now, most of you are aware that 12 Days is now offering tutorial services. For those interested, details are available at the website. So here are the questions. Good luck. And question number two. Here's question number three. And here's question number four. Recall that all these questions are referring to the same patient. And finally, this is a coronal view of a CAT scan on this patient. So let's begin the discussion. To get the correct answer to this series of questions, you need to interpret the pulmonary function test correctly. Let's start by reviewing the spirometry. On the boards, they generally tell you FEV1, FVC, and the ratio. Included here are actual PFTs where the normal value is listed as predicted mean, accounting for the patient's age, height, and gender. They also list percent of predicted achieved. So we can see that the FEV1 is 57% are predicted, and the force vital capacity is 79% are predicted. Next, we look at the ratio. And that ratio tells us the FEV1 is reduced out of proportion to force vital capacity. So this barometry is consistent with airway obstruction. Next, we turn our attention to lung volumes determined by body plethysmography. As with spirometry, where I specifically seek out the FEV1, FVC and ratio. With lung volumes, I look for total lung capacity and the residual volume. We see the total lung capacity is elevated to 128% of the predicted, while the residual volume is 185% of predicted. That is, the residual volume is almost twice the expected value. I highlight the RV to TLC ratio just to remind you that in obstructive disease, the increase in total lung capacity is largely due to an increase in the residual volume. I also like to refer to the elevation in total lung capacity as air trapping because that is exactly what is going on physiologically and it is easier for me to visualize. Next, we turn our attention to the diffusion capacity. First step is to make sure you're familiar with what the diffusion capacity is measuring. The diffusion capacity assesses the alveolar interstitial capillary interface. If you keep these three components in mind, you'll be sure to consider any and all conditions which interfere with gas diffusion. The main diseases assessed by diffusion capacity include loss of alveolar surface, as in COPD, diseases of the interstitium, with pulmonary fibrosis being the prototype, and diseases of pulmonary blood flow, as seen in pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary embolism. So this patient has a marked reduction of diffusing capacity. It is reduced to 48% are predicted. Of note, the reduced DLCO does not tell you the cause. You need to perform a clinical correlation based on history, physical exam, radiographs, and other parameters available, such as spirometry and lung volumes. Looking at these findings in composite, we can deduce that the patient has emphysema. These are classic PFTs in a patient with emphysema. But to review the other options, when the USMLE lists diffusion defect, they are specifically asking about diseases of the interstitium. In interstitial lung disease, we expect a low FEV1, low FVC, but the hallmark is a normal ratio as the airways remain patent. Continuing, decreased lung volumes will be reported, and the patient will often be described with dry, Velcro-like crackles. Hypoventilation is just that, not breathing enough. By definition, a patient with primary hypoventilation has a normal AA gradient. That is, the lungs are fine. The problem does not reside with the lung parenchyma. The prototypic conditions here include obstructive sleep apnea and opioid use. These two options refer to pulmonary vascular disease, which can cause abnormalities of diffusion, but not problems with ventilation or lung volumes as we see in this patient. And to finish this question, let's grab a look at the x-ray. 
As with all questions so far, you do not need to interpret the chest x-ray. The PFTs provided the diagnosis, but the chest x-ray, which prompted this question series, does show apical involvement as seen in central lobular emphysema. The right apex is almost devoid of normal lung markings. Other features that may be present in a patient with COPD include hyperinflation as well as flattening of the diaphragm, neither of which were present in this patient. So the PFT, symptoms, and chest x-ray are all consistent with emphysema, which is characterized on the PFTs by loss of alveolar surface area. On to question two. Now that we know the patient has COPD, they're asking us to identify the cell responsible for his tissue destruction. Answer, PMN. Do be aware that activation of tissue macrophages also contribute to the alveolar damage. Both cells elaborate proteolytic enzymes that destroy alveolar tissue as well as elastin. When I look at question options in general, I do try to make some quick associations with quick being the operative phrase here. This is good practice which gives rise to another one of the golden rules. Take less notes, not more. It is very hard for students to discern what is important or not. You can start unraveling some of those mysteries by noting recurrent and common themes that are encountered throughout QBanks and your study guides. So I offer these examples. When I see the fibroblast listed in a question like this, the association is pulmonary fibrosis with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and systemic sclerosis being prototypic conditions. When I see type 2 pneumocytes, that should set off a few alarms. We're talking surfactant and that whole class of derivatives. The type 2 pneumocyte is also the regenerative cell responsible for replacing damaged type 1 pneumocytes. Did someone say mast cell and eosinophils? Here are my quick associations with a short list including degranulation in both asthma and anaphylaxis. In anaphylaxis, the mast cells release the serum marker tryptase. Likewise, the eosinophil plays a role in the pathogenesis of extrinsic asthma as well as parasitic infections. I know that IL-5 is the cytokine responsible for recruitment and that the eosinophil releases major basic protein granules and coalescence of these granules are responsible for the charcoal-laden crystals reported in the sputum of asthmatics. Now coming back to the question, I don't obsess on the options, I just run the list and try to stay on top of the quick and easy associations. It's a good habit to get into. And speaking of good habits, before leaving a question, I do go back and study the question stem. It is really important to thoroughly understand the language of the question writer. In this case, there wasn't anything fancy or deceiving to analyze, but I do want you to maximize your benefits when using QBanks and other learning resources. Moving on, the next question highlights the favorite game of the USMLE. They give you a set of physiologic variables with the expectation you can interpret them, but then they go to the next step. They want you to derive the pathologic correlate. I love that. Of course, you can't figure out the pathology unless you're able to interpret the PFTs. So now we get to the language of pathology. You interpret the chest x-ray and PFT. You know the patient has COPD, but it won't do you any good unless you are familiar with the pathologic description. And here it is, interalveolar wall destruction. And now you know. I really do like pathology questions. The answers are very black and white, and they can't be too deceiving. To be sure, most of the pathology comes right out of Robbins. Yet, in spite of knowing this, I am always amazed by how so few students use definitive reference text. But that is a rant for another day. So here is the pathologic description for emphysema. Interalveolar wall destruction. Quickly reviewing the other options. Smooth muscle hyperresponsiveness describes bronchospasm as seen in asthma. Pulmonary artery smooth muscle proliferation is seen in both primary pulmonary hypertension as well as diffuse systemic sclerosis. I included the language of loosely formed granulomas to highlight that some are loose and some aren't. Loosely formed is the term used to describe those seen in hypersensitivity pneumonitis in comparison to those seen in sarcoid. This is a small point, but I mostly wanted you to be aware that the term hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a deceiving term as these patients do not have true hypersensitivity, rather type 3 and type 4 reaction. One of the other pathologic options was protease inhibitor deficiency. To exclude this option, you needed to identify the presence of disease at the apex. The graphic on the right demonstrates the coronal section on CT imaging of our patient in the vignette you can see the presence of disease at the apices. The graphic on the left shows a classic pattern of bibasilar destruction associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, 
described by deficiency of protease inhibitor. In this vignette, the location of disease involvement distinguished between central lobular emphysema at the apices and protease inhibitor deficiency. This is further discussed in our last question. On to question number four. We now have the physical examination features. The patient is described as having decreased breath sounds with hyperresonance throughout. Whereas hyperresonance does make us consider pneumothorax, we need to consider that description in the context of the vignette. The chest x-ray did not reveal pneumothorax and the PFTs are consistent with COPD. So this physical exam describes the pulmonary manifestations of COPD. Continuing, the patient has elevated central venous pressure and a loud second heart sound. That's it. Game, set, match. When they tell you the patient has a loud S2, they've just confirmed the presence of pulmonary hypertension. Get ready for the derivative. Insofar as the left lower sternal border, that is the location of the tricuspid valve. Pulmonary hypertension questions will frequently include an exam description of tricuspid regurgitation. This results from RV dilation in the setting of high pulmonary pressures with consequent dilation of the annulus. Generally speaking, in pulmonary hypertension questions, the USMLE includes this information so you can get yourself into some mischief. Be familiar with tricuspid regurg being present in patients with pulmonary hypertension. As to why the patient has pulmonary hypertension, the answer is hypoxia-induced vasoconstriction. As you're aware, pulmonary vessels vasoconstrict in the presence of hypoxia. This is the opposite of other circulatory beds in our body. Hypoxia elsewhere results in vasodilation, but not in our lungs. We vasoconstrict to shunt blood to areas with improved oxygenation. As for the other causes of pulmonary hypertension, here they are. Thromboembolism, primary pulmonary hypertension, and left-sided heart failure. And just a quick description of VSD. Left to right shunts can certainly cause pulmonary hypertension. The murmur, however, is typically described at the mid-left sternal border and is described as holosystolic and altered by maneuvers. The rest of the physical exam does not support this diagnosis. Remember, answer questions based on what they tell you and what they don't. They didn't give any other features associated with VSD. This was just a quick reminder. And finally, our last question showing that CT image again. He has abundant emphysematous changes in the apices, and this is classically associated with tobacco exposure, referred to in this question as toxin exposure. Here again is that CT image showing basal involvement in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And finally, I would remind you that whereas granulomas are the host defense to wall-off invaders, the granulomas themselves are destructive, but not in this patient. Chronic infectious illness in this patient was referring to bronchiectasis, which was not described. Depicted on the right image is a cross-sectional view in a patient with bronchiectasis. On the top part of the image, we can see mucus plugging. And the bottom describes the radiographic findings in a patient with bronchiectasis, that being bronchioles extending out to the periphery. And that will mercifully conclude this presentation at 12 days in March, the year in review series. In this section, we review the classic pathophysiologic features of emphysema while introducing another golden rule and emphasize a couple of good behaviors as you plow through the banks and study resources. If you have any questions or concerns about any of this material, please email me at 12 days in March. Thank you.